So session number seven, seeking first his kingdom, spiritual formation and the kingdom. Okay, so whenever I hear that phrase, seeking first the kingdom, I'll tell you what triggers in me. Okay, and this is my history. All right. From Matthew chapter six, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Okay. Now I was converted 23 years ago. And what that scripture meant was synonymous with being committed to church. Okay, so Sunday service, midweeks, Bible talks, devotionals, workshops, DP time, meetings of the body. Okay, and, uh, and that's what it was for a very long period of time. Okay, and, and understand uh, us old schoolers, midweek was every week. <laughs> Bible talk was every week. If you're on campus, devotionals were every week. Some t- we had a Tuesday morning devotional, 6 o'clock in the morning. And if you were late, you'd do push-ups. And uh, we had a Friday night devotion at 5 o'clock, okay? And uh, that, that doesn't include discipling time, studying the Bible with people, and all sorts of stuff, okay? But, but that's what was taught me, is that, you know, it's seeking first the kingdom was prioritizing in your time for kingdom-related events, okay? And... <coughs> I think it's important for us to be able to take a step back and consider this verse in the broader context of the passage, Matthew chapter 6, and then the whole corpus, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, and the entire gospel, okay? So to keep us energized, we're going to read through the whole of Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 34. Chapter 6. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast... Put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. 
If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But... Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, there's nothing like just drinking in God's word. You know, there's something invigorating about it. There's something refreshing about it. And uh, again, basic hermeneutic. You can't look at one verse in the text without looking at a major portion of the text that it forms part of, right? But context, context, context. Jesus is talking about life and righteousness, okay? And what the kingdom looks like practiced, okay? So, so is seeking first the kingdom, making a commitment to all the kingdom-related activities we have, church, Bible talk, is that seeking first the kingdom? It is in the sense that we prioritize God's kingdom, okay? But the emphasis here is on heart and it's on life and right heart and life orientation to Jesus. It's exactly what Raj was saying earlier, okay? We do all these things because He is the King and He reigns and rules in our lives. And because He reigns and rules in our lives, I do all these things, okay? Not the other way around. I'm not committed for the sake of being committed. I'm committed to Jesus. And as a result of being committed to Jesus and enamored by His love for me and gratitude for the cross, I do all these things. And look, there is this tension that we have to navigate, right? Because Jesus is the head of His church, okay? And you cannot separate head and body. So as we submit to His reign and rule as His body, so are we inseparable from His chosen people, His kingdom, okay? So we live with this tension. Trying to navigate, okay, what does that commitment look like? What does that lifestyle look like? Uh, where are we at? Okay, so we just zoomed out to chapter 6, and we're not going to have time to read chapters 5 through 7 as much as I wish we could, okay? But, but this aligns with the king's kingdom manifesto, right? Remember I talked about how a manifesto is a statement of beliefs and praxis, hey? Eh? And so the king calls us to what? right heart orientation that prioritizes the advancing reign and rule of God in every area of our lives. So what is the kingdom? Is it a building? Is it the people? Yes, no? Yeah. What is the kingdom? The kingdom of God, that is. To me, the kingdom is the advancing reign and rule of God in our lives. And you could even add in the lives of those around us that we interact with and that we influence. Okay? 
So that's in and outside of the church. Remember, we are in this world, but not of this world. And so you have God's kingdom constantly interacting with us and with the world. Okay, but, you know, again, we're talking about spiritual concepts here. And we're not about to do a whole workshop on, the, on what the kingdom is. Okay, but a simple definition for me is the advancing reign, of, reign and rule of God in our lives. Now, how does that relate to spiritual formation? Well, here is one way to look at the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Is if you ever look at the Beatitudes, what do they reflect? Kingdom attitudes, huh? <laughs> okay. Kingdom attitude, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? That's a rhetorical question. I don't have to answer, okay? Blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers. Okay, as much as some of these are action, again, it's attitude, all right? As we submit to the king, as we submit to his reign and rule in life, it means that I am pursuing him, his attitudes. And therefore, I interact, and we'll talk a, bit of, a lot about community, kingdom interaction, but to me, the Beatitudes are kingdom attitudes. Be attitudes, Okay. Salt and light. Love that verse, eh? Kingdom example. Be the salt. Be that which preserves God's moral goodness, as salt did in the ancient world. Be that which seasons the room when you walk in. When someone interacts with you, they sense there's something different about this person. You know, as I mentioned, I don't mind I'd look like it, but I'm slimming down, okay? And, and, and going to gym, just interacting with guys. There's this one guy, him and I were, so I've been interacting with him at the gym, and this guy swears like a trooper, okay? Every, you know, every word that comes out of his mouth is, is something. And me not saying anything, but just continuing to have a conversation, he stops swearing. Because he's picked up something. Why doesn't this guy swear? Why doesn't this guy go where I normally go in conversation? I'm not trying to be self-righteous. It's just because I don't swear, because I, I, I'm not, I, I'll deviate the conversation towards something else, all of a sudden it's the aroma of Christ that spreads to him. Mm. So when he interacts with me, he doesn't swear. Uh, is that me? No, that's not me. That's Jesus. Be the salt and be the light. Okay? Jesus' antithesis. Okay? This is, in my mind, his kingdom interacting in this world. Because what do we have in the world? We have murder. We have adultery. We have divorce. We have the breaking of oaths. We have violence. We have all of these things. And so how does Jesus' kingdom subjects interact, this world, interact with the world? And we live with this tension of in this world, but not of this world. So how do I interact? How do I discipline myself in order to interact in this way? And that's a part of our spiritual formation. And then when we get into acts of righteousness, and so looking forward to Anna talking about prayer and fasting tomorrow, but kingdom disciplines, giving, prayer, fasting, all these things we do, why? Because your disciples told you to do it. <laughs> because the church expects you to do it. No, it's because of Jesus. I'm so enamored by who He is that His reign and rule continues to advance not only in my life, but in the lives of those around. So, man, I see what Jesus sees. So let me give to the needy. You know, let me, let me discipline myself with regards to prayer. You know, and I don't want to delve too much into this, but uh, you know, Anna and I were on the same course of spiritual formation at Rocky Mountain. And, and again, a lot of the stuff that we're passing on to you is secondhand information. It's stuff that we've learned, grappled with, and, and, and the, the biggest part about this session and the sessions that we teach is trying to take 12 weeks of a master's level course and condense it into 30 minutes into something that you guys can find practical and helpful for yourselves. Eh? But, but I've been on a journey of discovery when it's come to prayer. 
And there are so many traditions and ways of praying within the Christian tradition that are inspiring. Okay? You know, something that has really helped me, and you can write this down, investigate it for yourself, the Jesus prayer. Okay? And um, the Jesus prayer is something very simple. How do you, how do you pray unceasingly? Paul instructs the church in Thessalonica, pray on all occasions, or some translations, every occasion. So how do I constantly occupy my thoughts and the attitudes of my heart with Christ? It's a great question, huh? Yeah. And many men and women have battled through the centuries asking that same question. Guys, what we need to recognize here is this. We are in a, we are in a fight for control of our minds. We live in the information age where stuff is bombarded at us. WhatsApp, TikTok. I mean, my daughter shows me stuff and I'm like, man, where? YouTube. I mean, it's just, it's all there, you know? And, and Richard Foster, who, was, um, who is a, a great spiritual formation leader and teacher, said, hurry is the enemy of our modern world. Our culture craves convenience. It craves the immediacy of now. And I'm, I, I sat there when I watched Anna doing uh, her class in meditation. Guys, it, man, these are spiritual disciplines that are centuries old to do what? Help you to detach and connect with Christ. Train yourselves in meditation. Experiment with different ways of praying. It's countercultural to what the world expects of you, which says, I want your attention now. And every second of every day. And so how do we discipline ourselves? And that is a lot of the fight that you and I have in spiritual formation is how do I discipline myself to constantly walk in step with the Spirit, be in contact with Jesus, and allow His righteousness to flow through me to impact other people's lives. Amen? Amen. So I group worry and, and passing judgment under kingdom disciplines as well. Okay? And in the final... Uh, section on chapter 7, I talk about kingdom paths. And I'd never quite connected this before until I did a deep dive. You know how Jesus always talks in parallels and, and comparisons, you know. Two ways, the broad road of destruction, the narrow path, two trees, one bearing good fruit, one bearing bad fruit, two claims, two boulders. Remember the, the boulders who built on solid ground? All of that is connected by choices. And right choices that we can make. Uh, again, also really appreciate what Raj said about how God will never violate our choice. And choosing the narrow path, choosing to build on solid ground, will always be a choice, whether you are one year in as a Christian or 20 years in as a Christian. So, some concluding thoughts here. The Sermon on the Mount provides a road map in our journey toward Christ-likeness. You know how you guys put Google on? You know, I arrived today um, at Hatfield Park Station. I, I took the car train in from Johannesburg. And I arrived and I, and I realized I hadn't put my mobile data on the Uber app. So I opened the Uber app because now I've got an Uber from the car train to here and it's not picking up anything. I'm like, man, what am I going to do? And then fortunately I realized my mobile, mobile data was off, switched it on, and all of a sudden I had a map. I could connect with my driver. Hope you guys are seeing the parallels here, okay? My driver being the Uber driver, but spiritually my driver being Jesus. And all of a sudden I had a starting point and a destination, okay? And that's what the Sermon of the Mount does, okay? It provides you with the starting point, which is King Jesus, emperor supreme authority and i'm just enamored by him so let me submit my life to him but that is the starting point learning to live under his reign and rule is what the rest of our christian lives are all about and the sermon of the mount provides that roadmap remember kingdom attitudes kingdom paths kingdom examples kingdom disciplines and there's so much there. Secondly, Jesus' main concern when it comes to the spiritual disciplines is right heart 
and life orientation toward God. Don't just do the spiritual disciplines because you know it's the right thing to do. The spiritual disciplines are a vehicle that puts you in the optimum space to interact with God, to interact with His Spirit, and to be close to Jesus. Amen? And that's what transforms us. Okay, let's not make prayer the goal. Let's not make fasting the goal, or solitude the goal, or meditation the goal. I need to become more of a meditator. No, the goal will always be Jesus. Meditation is the vehicle that I learn and train myself in to connect with Jesus. Do you guys get that? I don't know about you, but sometimes I get caught up in being committed to prayer for the sake of being committed to prayer. Instead of being committed to prayer because it connects me with Jesus and it transforms me more into His likeness. Amen? Amen. The, moment we get commi- the moment we are committed to commitment for the sake of commitment, you know what we become? Become just like the Pharisees. Where it's outward action and we've lost the right heart and life orientation toward God. Okay? And so... This enables His people to be a conduit for the Spirit of God to advance the reign and rule of Christ. And that's what seeking first His kingdom is all about. Me becoming less so that He can become more in order for His reign and rule to advance through me, in me, and around me. Amen? Amen. Amen.